once there was this uh, ordinary looking village boy who thought that he can never be a good speaker. And the reason was because his mother would often tell him, citing someone, that the intensity and the frequency of crying in the childhood is prediction for superior speech and intelligence later. And she also told that he was generally a calm and quiet child. He was born in a farmer's family, didn't have electricity in his village, and would see the newspaper for the first time in his high school. But as he grew, certain triggers would influence him and change his thought process. At the age of 16 and a half, he was traveling from his small village in South Haryana to India. Yes, I said India, because he had not seen India before except in the books. So he was traveling to India. During the journey, he was ridiculed and humiliated by his fellow friends by mocking at the way he spoke then. He had this typical tinge of uh, local dialect. So at the end of the journey, when he reached uh, Chennai, at that time Madras, the demographic and cultural diversity of the place and the humiliation he had undergone during the journey triggered him and motivated him to learn spoken English a better communication. He would study alongside, he would earn some degrees, masters and doctoral degrees in finance and economics and after about 15 years would teach in a business school. At the time, one of the uh, recent pass outs of the same business school came to him and uh, said that I have turned into a skilled trainer. But I am sorry, the professors do not know how to teach. He was very, very hurt, but the statement from the student made him realize that how teaching of the concepts of first industrial age during the third industrial revolution, which was then, made students literally suffer the professors. Later on, he would be known as someone who designed some of the most interesting and innovative education delivery systems, and without going to a regular college even for a day, he would become vice chancellor of some of the finest universities in the country. 36 years after he traveled to India, this boy feels extremely blessed when he stands before you on this stage today. <laughs> With all humility, may I submit that we all get triggers. We must get inspired by the fact that the power of triggers turned Narendra into Swami Vivekanand, Mohandas into Mahatma Gandhi, and Agnes into Mother Teresa. And in a very little way, it inspired me to think, to introspect, but most importantly, to act. And when I say act, I would try to break some of the myths of the education system which prevails in this country today. In 2014, with the help of my family, I started a school in rural Rajasthan. And I remember one of the parents coming and telling, my three and a half year old kid hasn't learned anything in last two months. Oh my God, he has been around this world for the last 42 months. He's wasting his time. And I remember telling him that let this child live his childhood at least in pre-primary school. Another parent was screaming at the principal and said, how can your teachers expect everyone to think differently? How will I compare my son's answer with that of another because everyone has given different answers. For this parent, what was more important was to be correct and not innovative and different. When I say different, I am reminded of something which I will ask you. Tell me, uh, how many of you have two or more siblings? Okay. How many of your friends would have that number? Well, rest of you must have seen them. We are seven of us. I remember uh, 
a dad would come and ask, which class you are in? And this has happened with most of us of my age, you know. Uh, we used to have large families. I have four children, including my daughter-in-law. Can you imagine if they are labeled or color-coded or barcoded? That you need to use barcode reader and say, oh, no, 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 you're not my sibling. Oh, let me, let me check with this guy. Are you my sibling? It doesn't happen that way. Certainly not because the nature has made each one different, look different, think different, and be different. And if that be so, and it is so, that why our education system is linear, is rigid, and it is conforming to the standard formats. During the today's talks, I have heard some of the issues. Let me try to answer some of them, if not all of them. The education system today needs to be reformed. And to indicate the sense of urgency, let me read these beautiful lines of Ravindranath Tagore. After the warnings and knocks at the door by the messenger, there was a voice in the dead of the night. Some said this was sound of the wheels. We said in a drowsy murmur, no. It must be the rumbling of clouds. The night was still dark. There was sound of drums. The voice came, wake up, delay not. We pressed our hands against the heart, shuddered with fear. Some said, lo, there the king's flag. We stood on our feet and cried, there is no time for delay. Yes. There's a sense of urgency that we need to reform our education system and reform it faster. There is indeed no time for delay. Today I'll broadly talk about three scenarios of education and first of them is technological advancements. I vividly remember when I was a school boy, my teacher would stand before me with two books in his hand, wrapped into old cover. And we thought it all came from him He's a genius without realizing that one book had the questions and the second book had the answers written by somebody else. Well, it was fine at that time, but today's student don't accept it. Today's student says, email me the list of books for self-reading. You generate new knowledge and give me new perspectives to take me beyond the books. And this is what we see every day happening. We live in an age where Facebook and smartphones have entered the class. You know, on smartphones, students can listen to the books. They don't have to read it. In 10 to 15 minutes, you can listen to the book summary and understand everything. I'm not saying this should be promoted and the reading habit should be lost. The 3D printer technology, 3D printing technology, which was mentioned by one of the previous speakers, you have machines which can produce ready to wear garments in a matter of few minutes. Stand in front of it using imaging technologies. What comes out in few minutes is a ready to wear garment without any stitches, without any joints. Now what will happen to the teaching of fashion designers and tailors? What will happen to these professions? Gone are the days when the tailor used to influence our decision on when should be our wedding date. You know, my father-in-law has presented a suit length that needs to be stitched and have to wear the time of wedding. They would say in India, most often, come for the trial and after the trial will execute the order. Remember, machines execute without trial. The second issue we need to analyze and talk about is interdisciplinary learning environment. The boundaries between and among the subjects are now getting increasingly blurred. We live in an age which is called the age of designer babies. Yes, with advanced technologies like genetic editing and the DNA technology, we can design a baby before it is conceived. Can you imagine if some of us were designed by our parents? looking at the catalogs kept in the doctor's clinic. And they say, well, look at this baby. Oh, no, 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 no. Show me something else. 
Okay, look at this one. Yeah, seems fine, but it's too expensive. Okay, then look at this one. Yeah, that seems fine. Let's finalize this. And this is how they finalize our design. We came to this world and sit in this auditorium this afternoon to listen to terrorist talks. Yes, we are in that age. The innovations in times to come will come out of interdisciplinary studies and research. Remember, the research converts money into knowledge, but it's the innovations that convert knowledge back into money. And unless we do that, the research will not make much sense to us. I suggest that what I've experimented in my career, there are excellent pedagogical tools which could be used. And there are no rocket science. You could engage students of different disciplines, different schools if required, and that is possible in a university setting, to work on projects like design a green building, design social systems for an aging society, what we will be 40 to 50 years hence. You know, we are called as a young nation as per average age, but after 50 years, we will be a nation of aged people and the needs will be different. Can we ask our students to think of that world and design the systems for that aged society? Think of engaging them in projects on the uh, genetic editing, on artificial intelligence as or the com uh, cognitive uh, intelligence as you call it by one of the companies this name has been given. Could involve them on social media or simply improving a website where students from different disciplines work together and contribute to innovative ideas. I think that's what the, the need of the R is rather than making our students stick to a single discipline and not allow them to look here and there. At this stage, I would like to mention about, uh, with all due apologies, an unholy nexus which has evolved in our country. And this nexus has held our school system hostage. Let me cite some figures. In 2015 alone, 87% of primary school kids and 92% of high school kids took private tuitions and contributed to a $40 billion industry. And these coaching centers were often run by half educated or half qualified people. Yes, I mean what I say. If our mainstream education system is such that it doesn't need those so-called skills, why should we need this shadow system of coaching? A similar kind of uh, nexus has evolved in 11th and 12th classes. I've been going around looking for admissions for my daughter and believe me, I don't find classes being held in large number of schools and they're conveniently running as non-attending regular schools. What a concept. It amuses me. In higher education, this nexus has raised its head in the form of skill-based courses leading to employability. My personal belief and experience says that you cannot teach skills by teaching them through separate subjects. These subjects have to be overarching courses running throughout the curriculum. They have to be like common thread which connects the mainstream courses or the specialization courses. We have to come together, all stakeholders, including parents above all, to break this nexus. The third scenario we need to discuss is how do we link learning to emotions. Being different, every child thinks differently and in a different state of mind at a given point of time. The teacher's behavior, motivation, respect and empathy are now unavoidable ingredients of teaching learning process. You just can't avoid it. I remember in one of my uh, workshop for teachers, a young teacher coming up to me and saying, that my students get affected by the way I get dressed. And shared the story of a little girl who walked up to her in class and says, you're wearing very expensive shoes today, but I'm afraid they're not going well with your lovely dress. And thus gave her double pain. Double pain of what? Reminding that it was an expensive shoes and the second that it's not being liked. These kind of emotions play. Stanley Kubrick, one of the thinkers on education says, 
the problem of education is that we teach children anything with fear as the only basic motivation. And fear of what? Fear of getting a failed grade, fear of not remaining with your classmates, and so on. And he says, interest can produce learning on a scale compared to fear if you compare a nuclear explosion to a firecracker. It has been proven empirically that a positive approach to discipline cases an empathetic approach to discipline cases have resulted in reduced suspensions. And this emotional connect is what is going to bring the learnings that are required in the change environment. According to Institute of Humane Education, there are four key elements of quality. And these are providing accurate information for us to know the challenges of our times, foster creativity, curiosity, and critical thinking, instill reverence, respect, and responsibility, and finally, provide positive choices and tools to solve the problems. Our education system has had a glorious past when Nalanda and Takshila attracted the entire world. I find no reason why it should be questioned for quality today. If I give you the examples of education, when I discuss about education, I talk about about one and a half million schools, 300 million children, 760 universities, more than 42,000 colleges, 32 million students enrolled in higher education. That represents about 22 to 23 uh, enrollment ratio from schools. About half a million going abroad for studies. Lot of unfilled seats. And big question marks on the quality and employability of the graduates. It is that scenario we are talking about education. So with these four ingredients and the fact that we have had a glorious past. As we move into the future, if we shift from linear thinking to divergent thinking, if we shift from rigidity to flexibility, if we believe that every child has talents and should not be weeded out based on old age evaluation concepts. And I must share one experience here that in one of the projects, a students were given the task of how to make a 3D printer and something fascinating. A very well researched report was awarded A plus by the professors. And students who actually made a 3D printer were awarded only B+. Naturally, those students who made a 3D printer came to me and kept this beautiful machine on my table and started printing a chocolate for me. And said, sir, what flavor do you want? You know, listening to that question, I had to intervene. And that will lead to entire change in the evaluation system of the university. Because in the new era, we are trying to push learning to the level of making it. So if we believe that every child has talents and need not be weeded out, if we believe in the mainstream education system rather than in the shadow system of tuitions, if we become academically honest and if we make our education system humane, I have absolutely no doubts that its lost glory will be regained. Thank you very much. Thank you.